All right, and hello again, United States history students. We left off at the last lecture with the First World War raging throughout Europe and around the world, and the United States of America, under the presidential leadership of Woodrow Wilson, staying out of that terrible conflict. When Woodrow Wilson ran for re-election in 1916, he ran under the campaign slogan of Vote for Wilson, he kept us out of the war. Wilson was re-elected in 1916, takes the oath of office once again in January of 1917, and in April of 1917, he asks Congress for a declaration of war. Within three months, Woodrow Wilson went from a pacifist president to saying, we, the United States of America, have to get involved in this most terrible of wars. So we need to ask ourselves, in those three months, what happened? Well, a big reason why the United States of America joined the First World War had to do with these things. The German U-boats, German submarines during the First World War. If you remember in 1915 and 1916, these German U-boats were a menace to the United States of America. A German U-boat had sunk the Lusitania. The following year, a German U-boat just popped up at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And when we get to the year 1917, all sides who are involved in the First World War are truly exhausted, both Allied powers and Central powers. Millions of lives have been lost, and both sides are looking for a knockout blow. By 1917, both sides want to do something big, something terrible, something horrendous, just to make the other side give up and end the war. So Germany comes up with a two-part plan for this knockout blow in 1917 so that they can win the war. Here was their plan for 1917. One, find the communist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin, who is living in Switzerland at the time, sneak him into the Russian Empire to have him start a communist revolution, and then, once he's successfully overthrown the government in St. Petersburg, to create a peace treaty with the Germans, which would give Germany a whole bunch of land in Eastern Europe and give Vladimir Lenin control of Russia, and end the war on the Eastern Front. As you know, that plan went into effect in the beginning of 1917, and it was successful. By the time you get to October of 1917, and actually really November of 1917, that revolution is successful. Russia and some of its neighboring countries were transformed into the Soviet Union, and we have now the first communist country on the face of the earth, the first communist country in history. The first part of Germany's two-part plan to win the war in 1917 was clearly a success. Now, at the exact same time that the Germans are putting in this plan, putting this plan into effect to get Lenin into into Russia, they initiated a second plan to end the war on the Western Front against Britain and France. And that was to let loose their subs. So if you remember, after the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, Kaiser Wilhelm II had agreed that the Germans would not engage in what was called unrestricted submarine warfare. And I highlighted that term in the previous lecture unrestricted submarine warfare. And that term should be pretty clear. Unrestricted means no restrictions, means the subs can shoot out of the water whatever it is they want to shoot out of the water. Doesn't matter if it's a military vessel or if it's a passenger liner. Unrestricted submarine warfare means the submarines can blow anything out of the water they want. And the Germans really feel that this will help them win the war on the Western Front. And honestly, it might have had things gone a little differently. Britain and France are dependent upon their colonies, they're dependent upon resources being shipped into their countries. In order for the British to even fight, they've got to ship men across the English Channel into Belgium and France. If the Germans just unleash their subs and they begin blasting everything out of the water, merchant vessels, military vessels, even those passenger liners, this will probably bring Britain and France to their knees and they'll be forced to surrender. This might seem terrible and brutal, but the Germans would also say, you know what else is terrible and brutal? And I haven't talked about this yet in the lectures. Britain had blockaded Germany so that it couldn't import food and more and more Germans were starving. So everybody's playing hardball at this point in time. Everybody's looking for this knockout blow. 
So for the Germans, their knockout blow is going to be unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic. So that, paired with getting Lenin into Russia to start a revolution, this should win the war for Germany. But there was a problem with doing unrestricted submarine warfare. And that was keeping the United States of America out of this war. Because we Americans at the time, we were selling so much stuff to Britain and France and other European countries at this time. We were profiting so much off of this war that if the Germans let loose their subs, they're going to kill Americans. They're going to, going to destroy American merchandise. And this might just get Americans involved in this war. Now, the Germans weren't that afraid of the United States at this time. In fact, the ambassador to Germany in Washington, D.C., had sent a letter to the German government in Berlin stating that Americans, by their temperament, were pacifistically inclined. We liked peace too much, and our primary interest was simply making money, so that there was no real fear in the United States of America joining this war. But there was still some concern that Americans may jump in. And if we did jump in, we'll jump in with a whole bunch of men and a whole bunch of resources. And that would make Germany winning the war on the Western Front more difficult. So in an attempt to keep the United States of America out of this war, here's what Germany did. The image that you're looking at here is the image of a telegram. Specifically, it is remembered as the Zimmermann telegram, named after the man who sent, sent it, Arthur Zimmermann, who worked for the German government in Berlin. And he sent it to the German ambassador in Mexico who was, of course, staying in the capital of Mexico, Mexico City. This telegram was intercepted by the British, and the British take a look at it, and clearly it is written in a numerical code. So British cryptologists get after it, and they break the code. And this is a fun image to look at if you're able to look at your screen right now. You see on the left-hand side of the screen the actual Zimmerman telegram, and it's written in code. And on the right-hand side of the screen are the notes that the British cryptologist took and how they broke the code. And as you start at the top of that image there on the right, you see the numbers and you see the words that are associated with the numbers. And the words are, of course, all in German because it's being sent from the German government to the German ambassador in Mexico City. But as you get about halfway down, you start to see some words that you recognize, like Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. Clearly, this secret message sent from Germany to Mexico involves states in the American Southwest that border the country of Mexico. And let's remember, in the 19-teens, the United States doesn't really have a great relationship with Mexico. Remember that we invaded Mexico in 1914. So here's the letter as a whole that was decoded by the British and sent to the Americans. And look at what it says. And remember, this letter was sent from the German government to the German ambassador in Mexico City. They wrote, We intend to begin on the 1st of February, unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together general financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president, that would be the president of Mexico, of the, of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain and add the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, nominate Japan to immediate adherence and, at the same time, mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the President of Mexico's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace, signed Zimmerman. So this is what Germany was encouraging Mexico to do. Germany knew the whole history of conflict between the United States of, Mexico, United States of America and Mexico. Anybody who knows their history, especially the history of the 19th and 20th century, knows that there is conflict between the United States and Mexico. Specifically in the 1840s, 
where in the United States of America, under the Polk administration, pretty much prompted a war, provoked Mexico into a war so that we could take areas in the American Southwest, specifically parts of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona, away from Arizona, and, or, or away from Mexico, and make them ours. Germany now tells Mexico, you can get it back. Invade the United States of America. When we unleash our subs, you attack the United States of America. That'll keep America out of the war, and we will also support you. Okay. Now, this letter does reach Mexico City, and the Mexican government is informed about this initiative. But at the same time, the letter was deciphered by the British, and the American government is informed of this. So a few things about the Zimmerman telegram. First of all, there's some conspiracy theories around the Zimmerman telegram that the British made it up in order to get the Americans involved in the war and come and help them. That seems to be untrue because Arthur Zimmerman never denied sending it. Also, Mexico, did they consider this? Well, yes, they did consider it. But after review, they decided that there's no way that their Mexican military could ever defeat the United States military. And a campaign, an invasion into the United States of America might ultimately end in disaster for Mexico, so they decided not to go through with it. But the American people are informed of this. Here's a funny little cartoon from the time. You have the German, and you can tell it's a German because he has his Kaiser-like mustache there. And then you'll notice the German helmets at the time had these pointed tops to them. And you have this character of a Mex Mexican in a sombrero, and the German is whispering secretively to the Mexican, join with Germany and you get a bit of the United States. So what you have going on in the United States in the spring, and really late winter of 1917, going into the spring of 1917, is... First of all, unrestricted submarine warfare, the Germans have unleashed their subs, and two, knowledge that Germany has encouraged Mexico to invade the United States of America. So Germany has clearly made itself the enemy of the United States of America. It's hard to ignore this by 1917. You could ignore it all the way up to 1917, but when 1917 rolls around, Germany is our enemy. So on April the 2nd, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson speaks before a joint session of Congress, asking them for a declaration of war against Germany. So this man who has pledged peace for the previous, well, nearly three years now, is now saying that the United States of America must enter the war. What was his rationale? First of all, Woodrow Wilson had referred to the Great War as, quote, the war to end all wars as if this war was so terrible that there would never be a, sub a war following it. This was it. This is the final big war because it's so catastrophic. Now, over 100 years later, we look, at ba look back at this, and many people want to make fun of Woodrow Wilson for being so naive as to make a proclamation like this, that this is the war to end all wars. But truly, there had been nothing so catastrophic as the Great War at the time that it was happening. And when you had millions upon millions of people dying, there was first of all the sense that this might be it. This is the last great war. We'll, we will never do anything like this for at least a long, long time to come ever again. But then there's Woodrow Wilson's explanation for why the United States of America is now going to enter the war. So at this point in time, it seems like we're going into war because we've been provoked by Germany, and we have. But Woodrow Wilson, our very intellectual history and political science professor turned president of the United States, gives us a reason for fighting. Wilson proclaims that the world must be safe for democracy. The world must be made safe for democracy. This is why the Americans are going to fight. We are going to go into Europe. We're going in to fight along with the allies, allies which are Britain and France, which are also democracies, we're going to fight against empires like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, like the German Empire, the German Empire being the big one we're going to fight against, and then we are going to force them to become a democracy. And when we do that, that will make the Great War, the First World War, the last Great War in history. Here's Wilson's logic for this. This war was caused by a handful of individuals in governments, 
These people were not democratically elected. They were working for some sort of monarch, usually an emperor. Germany had an emperor. Russia had an emperor. Austria had an emperor. These individuals who started the war were not democratically elected. So Wilson's vision is this. You create a world where you force everybody to be a democracy. So you liberate the people of the world. Once you do that, and then you have a situation in the, like we have in the United States of America, where the people's representatives control the military, then you will significantly reduce the chances of a massive war like this ever happening again. So another way of thinking about this is like this. If the countries in Europe had all been democratic in the year 1914, would World War I have actually happened? Did the people want this war? Wilson believes no. Your ordinary, everyday people in Germany, France, Britain, Russia, nobody would have really cared about the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and they would have left that to be a quarrel between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia. So this is why the United States of America is going to fight in the First World War. It was for reasons of idealism. The United States is not going to fight to try to acquire anything. We are going to fight to create a more peaceful world. So this is our purpose for fighting the, in the First World War, according to Woodrow Wilson. We're going to go in. We're going to win this war. We're going to help Britain and France win this war. And we're going to create democracies in Europe. We're going to make the world safe for democracy. What we are not going to be fighting for is any additional territory. Does the United States want any land in Europe? No, we don't want to conquer Europe. What about money? Do we want money? Do we want to extract funds, war reparations from Germany? No, we do not. We're not going to fight for land. We're not going to fight for money. What are we fighting for? We're going to fight to liberate the people of Europe. We are going to make the world safe for democracy. So this is our idealistic reason for fighting the First World War. Now, here's another reason why we are going into the First World War that was really unbeknownst to most Americans in the year 1917. This wasn't really reported to the American people into the, until the middle of the 1930s. And it was a congressman from North Dakota named General Nye who presented his Nye report to Congress in the 1930s. And the Nye report identified the significant economic motives that the United States had for going to war. Now, if you remember, in the previous lecture, I talked a lot about how America, the American economy was doing great during the First World War. Because first of all, we had manufactured a lot of guns and a lot of bullets, and we'd sold them to European countries, but mostly to Britain and France. And then Britain and France went into debt, and they took out loans from American banks. So by the time we get to 1917, the loans that we had lent to European countries had grown significant. First of all, because we were being neutral, we lent to both sides. We lent money to both sides, uh, both the Central Powers and the Allied Powers. But we lent a lot more money to the Allied Powers, as you see on this slide here. The United States of America, between 1915 and 1917, loaned to Germany $27 million, and that's $27 million in 1917 dollars. But Britain and France, we had loaned $2.3 billion. So, okay, so what? What does this mean? Well, it means this. If Germany's two-part knockout plan for 1917 proves to be a success and Britain and France surrender to Germany, what then happens? Well, it means the, these banks in the United States, which had lent all of this money to Britain and France, they're likely not getting their money back. These banks then lose $2.3 billion, and that's $2.3 billion in 1917 terms. I just looked it up. It would be around $47 billion today. We lose that money. The American banks lose that money, which means that likely the United States of America will enter into a major depression if the Allies lose this war. So there was this economic motive to get the United States of America involved in this war. Now, what this means is this. The United States of America says we're not fighting for money, and we're not. But this will influence Britain and France at the end of the war. 
to demand money from Germany, and they have to demand money from Germany so that they can begin the process of paying back the United States of America. Okay. Now, not a lot of Americans know that this is going on in 1917, but all Americans are pretty aware of the fact that we are now changing our tune significantly. How do we shift from being a culture of isolationism to a culture of war? So in other words, how does the United States government change the culture of our country from being isolationist, meaning we mind our own business, and isolationism was an important term in the 19-teens, it's an important term that you should know to understand the culture of the United States prior to the declaration of war in April 1917, we were an isolationist country, we wanted to mind our own business, we wanted to mind our own business. How does the government change our culture from being a country of isolationism to a country of interventionism, where we're getting involved, where we're participating in this war. In other words, much more simply, how do we go from a culture, how do we go from peace to war? How do we make that transition? So the United States government was very proactive in changing the culture of the United States of America. First of all, there was a major propaganda campaign that happened in the United States of America. We need to inspire young men, specifically men between the ages of 21 and 30, to register or simply just to outright enlist in uh, the armed forces or to register for the draft. And I'll talk about the draft here in a second. But we had to inspire Americans to fight. And so there was a massive government-funded propaganda campaign beginning in 1917. So what is propaganda? Well, a general definition of propaganda is this. Propaganda is biased or misleading information used to promote a particular political cause. Now, in the case of the First World War, it well, there was some misleading information. I'll talk about that here in a second. But really, the word to focus on here in 1917 is bias. And the bias is pro-war. War is good. We need to fight. Part of, especially if you're a young man, your manhood as an American depends on your willingness to fight for your country. So this very famous image that you see here on the screen right now of Uncle Sam pointing his finger at you saying, I want you for the United States Army. This image comes out of 1917. Uh, it was an artist, and the artist's last name was Flag, Flag with two Gs. I've always thought that was kind of ironic. He created this, which is probably the most famous propaganda image in the entirety of American history. The point of the propaganda is, of course, to inspire young men to enlist in the armed services and be willing to fight for their country. We're creating a country that supports war out of a country that, not but a few months before, was a very pacifist country. Here's another great piece of American propaganda. Again, the point of propaganda is to manipulate you emotionally, and as especially, especially as a young man, to really make you feel that you are less of a man if you do not fight in this war. So here's a, a great poster that clearly focuses on your manhood. It's a picture of a young lady dressed up in a sailor's uniform, declaring how she wished she were a man, because if she was, she'd join the United States Navy. And then, of course, the other piece of propaganda, or the other type of propaganda, which would be misleading information, would relate to demonizing the enemy. So we're going to fight the Germans. So the Germans are going to be portrayed in American propaganda, just like they were in French and English propaganda earlier in the war, as these barbaric monsters. And this all started with, you know, the German invasion of France through neutral Belgium and then what transpired between the Belgian civilians and the invading German army. And so the portrayal of the Germans as monsters. And this was not hard to do in 1917 because the Germans were doing truly terrible things to the Americans. Unrestricted submarine warfare, encouraging Mexico to invade. Now, so far what I've shown you is, in terms of propaganda, are the posters that were made by the United States government. And hey, if I could just talk about this one particular poster right here with the uh, evil German attacking us out of a trench with his bloody fingers. Notice that this poster is um, an advertisement for American citizens to buy liberty bonds. This was a way of helping to finance the war. A war bond, there's a major war bond effort that happened in both World War I and World War II. One way you can think of it is an investment in the United States government during wartime. So you give money to the United States government we win the war and there's a return on your investment. So liberty bonds, war bonds. 
Okay, so this is a poster, but there were other more compelling forms of propaganda, and that goes back to the movie houses. Remember that we're seeing it, the Americans at this point in time in history, they're watching newsreels in between the films, and then sometimes there were films themselves, because films are very powerful in terms of their ability to um, inspire us or manipulate us emotionally. I mean, they still have this effect on us today. Films are emotionally powerful, and our government funded the production of films that were made to make you hate the Germans and make you want to fight. So let's check out an example of this. To stiffen the will to win, Mass propaganda was used for the first time. This propaganda they told us about them killing women and children and one thing and another. They had a lot of propaganda about that there. The, uh, the Hun, you know, they called him. And uh, how he'd go through these villages when he'd capture them and, and kill all the people off and that there. That's the stuff that they told us. To feed you up to get you mad, I guess. Atrocities alleged to have been committed by the Germans in Belgium were presented in melodramatic form. We were wütend über diese Diffamierung. We were furious about this land. We always said that it was evil propaganda, and we felt that we Germans were powerless to answer back. So beyond propaganda, how else did the United States government drum up support for America's involvement in the war? Well, now's a good time to introduce this individual. His name was Herbert Hoover. He is an important man in 20th century American history. Herbert Hoover, at the time of the outbreak of the war in 1914, was an American businessman living in London, England. At the outbreak of the war, when the United States of America was neutral, he helped to organize the safe extraction of approximately 100,000 Americans who were living in Europe at the time. Europe is going to war, get the Americans out of Europe. And then immediately thereafter, he helped to organize an organization called the Committee for Relief in Belgium. The point of this organization, as should be relatively clear from its title, was to help the country of Belgium, and specifically to provide food for the people in Belgium. Belgium had gone pretty much under German occupation, the Germans didn't have enough food for their own citizens and their own soldiers, so there was not a lot of concern at all for the Belgian civilians. So what Herbert Hoover did was organize this Committee for Relief in Belgium, in which he got international food donations that would be brought into German-occupied Belgium. Now, this means that you've got an American businessman who's created an organization that's going to get food into Belgium. This means that all sides had to recognize Herbert Hoover's Committee for Relief in Belgium, which means this organization had its own boats, it had its own trains, it had its own flag, it had its own transport vehicles, you know, trucks and such. It pretty much was a republic of philanthropy. Its own organization, not connected to or working for any country to help save the people of Belgium. And Herbert Hoover was the chairman for this organization. When World War I breaks out, or rather, when the United States of America joins World War I, then Herbert Hoover goes to work for, the, for a new organization called the United States Food Administration. And the goal of the U.S. Food Administration, which, by the way, don't confuse the U.S. Food Administration with the United States Food and Drug Administration. Don't confuse it with the, with the FDA. This U.S. Food Administration, it had two goals. One, it was during and after the war, and Americans' involvement in the war was to get food to all people in Europe, no matter where they are in Europe. The people in Europe were starving. And there was a strong sense that, especially after the war, there was a strong chance for revolution if people didn't get fed. So the U.S. Food Administration was to get food, mostly from American farms, to the people of Europe in an effort to save Europe. 
The other thing Herbert Hoover was responsible for with the U.S. Food Administration was stabilizing food prices in the United States of America. With all this food being shipped out to Europe, there might be great fluctuation in food prices here in the United States of America. He wanted to stop that, so the U.S. Food Administration worked to regulate the price of food here in the United States of America. Here are some interesting propaganda posters for the United States Food Administration after the United States is involved in the war. The one on the left is very interesting. It targets first-generation American immigrants. So it says, if you take a look at it, you've got all these immigrants coming into the United States of America. You've got this kindly white American man welcoming in the immigrants. You've got the Statue of Liberty in New York City behind him. And it says on this propaganda poster, food will win the war. You came here seeking freedom. Now you must help to preserve it. Wheat is needed for allies, waste nothing. And then the propaganda poster on the right, the, you've got Lady, Liber Lady Liberty looking longingly at you. Be patriotic, sign your country's pledge to save the food. In other words, donate food to the United States Food Administration so this can go to Europe so we can help the European people. Food will win the war. Herbert Hoover. He's important because in 1928, he will be elected president of the United States of America. And it's interesting when we talk about him as president to remember that this is what made him a national figure. He was the chairman for the Committee of Relief in Belgium and then later on the U.S. Food Administration. It's interesting to remember that when you consider the decisions that he makes as president of the United States of America later on in American history, about 10 years after all this. Okay, the next thing we need to do as we get prepared to fight is actually to prepare to fight. We need soldiers in the United States military. Because the United States of America stayed out of the fight, when our soldiers finally get trained a little bit and sent off to Europe, they'll be referred to as the Doughboys. Why is the American soldier in World War I called a Doughboy? Well, there are several reasons for this. There's one silly reason which, that I've heard of, which is that the buttons on the... Uh, on our soldiers' jackets look like unbaked cookies, but probably the real reason why we were called the Doughboys was because we hadn't seen battle yet. Therefore, we were untried, we were untested, we were uncooked. We were dough. The American soldier had the reputation when we showed up in 1918 after a full year of training of being highly enthusiastic. We were very American. We showed up with all this harumph and fighting spirit. And the French and the British that welcomed us, and they were very happy to see the Americans show up, they were very war-hardened. They had endured the war for nearly four years by the time the Americans showed up and began engaging in combat in summer of 1918. So the French and the British, these grisly, war-hardened veterans, and the Americans, all smiles and enthusiasm. Here we go. We're going to win. We were all enthusiastic. We were untried and untested and uncooked by the horrors of war. That's why we were called the Doughboys. Now, in order to have enough Doughboys to fight, we needed to get more men into the army. This means a draft. The Selective Service Act of 1917 made it a law that all men between the ages of 21 and 30 had to report to their local polling station. This would be wherever they would ordinarily go to vote, and they had to register for the draft. If you didn't do this, then you were in violation of the law, and you would be arrested and sent to jail. Now again, this just registers you for the draft. So when you were a young man and you went to register at your local polling station, you are not then in the military but essentially you're on the government list, you may be selected, you may be conscripted into the military. And that's what the Selective Service Act of 1917 did. It's interesting that back then in 1917, it was 21. Uh, that's because I assume you had to be 21 to vote back then, not 18. Today, if you are a young man in the United States, you have to register for the draft at age 18, not 21. We really did need a draft if we we're going to fight in this conflict and not in... 1917, the size of our military at the, at the outbreak of the war in Europe in 1914 was 100,000. We had a very small military. The size of our military in 1914 was smaller than the military of Portugal. We had a small military. If our military in 1914 was 100,000, that means pretty much you could fit our entire military into Ohio State Stadium. But then we had the draft. Four years later, the size of our military was... 4 million in 1918, so we grew significantly. Now, this number will plummet again after the war, 
because once the war is over, first of all, as a soldier, you're done. You break off all ties to the military. They break off all ties to you. And we return once again in the 1920s to being mostly an isolationist country. Here is an image of the draft lottery in the year 1917. There will be drafts like this in American history during World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. We will spend a lot more time talking about what the draft was like during the Vietnam War, because that draft had profound cultural consequences. In 1917, when we raised our army, 30% of our army were, was volunteers, which is a pretty significant number, considering you know, whatever 30% of 4 million would be. That's a lot of young men that volunteered their service. But 70% of our military ended up being drafted. Uh, the previous draft in American history happened during the Civil War, which was half a century before the First World War. The big difference between the First World War and the Civil War was that during the Civil War, if you got drafted and you didn't want to go, you could pay for a substitute. So that was a way, if you were rich, you could get out of fighting. Uh, the clause for, for hiring a substitute for, to fight for you was removed with the Selective Service Act of 1917. You can now no longer pay for somebody else to go and fight for you. All right, and as we continue to talk about how America evolved from an isolationist country to a country that is going to participate in this war, it is important to know that there were a great number of Americans who still did not want to fight in the First World War. And there was some public criticism of the United States government and Wilson in particular. So Congress passed laws to intimidate people from speaking out against the United States government or doing anything to reverse America's course of action in going to war. So there were the very famous Espionage and Sedition Acts of the First World War era. So espionage, let me just define these two terms. Espionage. Espionage is a fancy word that means spying. So if you're talking about espionage, you're usually talking about spying. Sedition. Sedition means to speak out to encourage a, re a rebellion or a revolution. So espionage is spying. Sedition is speaking out to encourage a revolution. So here are the espionage and sedition acts of the late 1910s. So there were actually two different pieces of legislation. The first one comes out in 1917. The Espionage of Act of 1917 broadly said that it was illegal to interfere with the war effort. So it's become clear to us that there were not there, there were German spies in the United States prior to the war. They're still here now. And these are American citizens who have been who have become agents for the German government. So the Espionage Act of 1917 would stop these individuals or any individuals from doing anything that would interfere with the draft or with the development of our military to fight in the First World War. Now, more specifically, there was the Sedition Act of 1918. This was a little bit more direct and controversial. So the Sedition Act of 1918, this made it illegal to publicly use language that was, quote, disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive toward the United States government and our involvement in the First World War. In other words, if you gave a public speech or if you wrote an editorial in your, for your local newspaper about how the United States of America should not be fighting in this war, then you could be arrested, tried, and sent to jail. Now, the Sedition Act was in effect from 1918 through 1920. In that time, approximately 1,000 Americans were imprisoned for speaking out openly against the First World War. And this was probably the most famous individual the leader of the Socialist Party of the United States of America, the labor union organizer who became famous during the Pullman strike, Eugene V. Debs. Most socialists throughout Europe and the United States of America were very much against the First World War. They saw this as a war in which the wealthy and powerful were forcing the poor people to go and fight and die for a fairly worthless cause. Debs was openly outspoken about how the United States of America shouldn't be fighting in this war and how this war overall was a very stupid war. So he was placed on trial for violating the Sedition Act of 1918, and he went to jail, where he ran for president 
In the 1920 election, Eugene V. Debs ran for president five times as the candidate for the Socialist Party of the United States of America. He, of course, never got elected. However, in 1920, he still received just under a million votes, 919,799 votes from around the United States of America. That was 3.4% uh, in 1920. Uh, that was down from the 6% that he got in 1912. Eugene V. Debs, probably the most famous person who was placed in prison for violating the Sedition Act of 1918. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, hey, this is the United States of America. Don't we have the First Amendment right to freedom of speech if we don't like something? Part of being American is you're allowed to speak out against it. I mean, if it was illegal to speak out against the actions of the government, then wouldn't every cast member and writer from Saturday Night Live and pretty much every talk show host in the United States of America be thrown in jail pretty much immediately? Isn't the Sedition Act a clear violation of the First Amendment to the United States Constitution? Well, so, of course, there were many people back then who thought that way, and so, naturally, we have a court case that works its way up to the United States Supreme Court by the year 1919, and the Supreme Court rules on this question of whether or not the Sedition Act of 1918 is in violation of the First Amendment with the famous case Schenck versus the United States, in which the Supreme Court upheld the Sedition Act of 1918. Providing the majority opinion was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at the time, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes was also, for what it's worth, a veteran of the Civil War. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, in his majority opinion, states that free speech has limits. He stated in his opinion, free speech would not protect a man from yelling fire in a theater and causing a panic, stating that to speak out against the United States of America and the government's decision to enter into war would also in some way cause a panic. The Supreme Court ruled that a Sedition Act can be applied at a time when there is quote, a clear and present danger in the United States of America. And for the Supreme Court of the United States of America, Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare and its provocation to encourage Mexico to invade the United States of America constituted a clear and present danger. So if Eugene V. Debs is an example of an individual who spoke out against the war, remember that there were quite a few individuals who volunteered to fight for the United States of America, including this individual right here. So the draft only targeted men between the ages of 21 and 30. This young man right here, who was from Missouri, he was 33 years old and legally blind in one eye. On two counts, this is an individual who did not have to fight. But he was one of many young men, if you can consider 33 to be a young man, I'll say 33 as a young man. <laughs> he was one of many young men who wanted to get into the military to do his part and to fight. Now, when you go to enlist in the armed forces, back then and still today, you have to pass a physical exam. This 33-year-old young man knew he would fail the exam, in particular the eye exam. So what he did was he got a copy of the eye chart that would be used by the examiner. How he got a copy of this eye chart, I have no clue. But he got a copy of the eye chart and he memorized the eye chart so that when he went into his exam and the doctor said, okay, read the sixth line of this eye chart, he would be able to do that not from sight, but rather from memory. And this young man from Missouri goes on to distinguish himself in battle in the First World War, comes home, and approximately 30 years later is the president of the United States of America. His name was Harry S. Truman. We will learn about him later. Okay, so let's continue to talk a little bit more about the Doughboys. I just want to take a minute here to talk about what life would be like if you were a young man in between the ages of 21 and 30 living in central Ohio at this time, and you either volunteered for the United States Army or you were conscripted into service in the United States Army. Then you would have been shipped an hour south of Columbus to the city of Chillicothe, Ohio where in the year 1917, very quickly an army barracks was constructed and this is where you would do your basic training from the summer of 1917 until the spring of 1918, at which point in time you would have been shipped off to France to go and fight. There are only, I believe, a couple of buildings left from Camp Sherman that are still around today. You can go and visit Camp Sherman. It's now a national park site, 
It's now today Hopewell Culture National Historic Park. There were quite a few Native American earthworks that were where Camp Sherman was, and they actually had to knock down a few of those, or quite a few of those Native American earthworks. And so the National Park site that's there today teaches the story of both the Hopewell Native American culture as well as the story of Camp Sherman during the First World War. There were quite a few men that trained there in the thousands. A young Dwight David Eisenhower visited Camp Sherman. Eisenhower would later go on to be the Supreme Allied Commander of World War II and future President of the United States. Also at Camp Sherman in the fall of 1917, they formed their own football team and they played Ohio State. Ohio State won. This particular image is one of many that was a fad at the time, which was to take hundreds if not thousands of people and organize them into a particular image and then take an aerial photograph of these people all standing together. What you're looking at here are 21,000 soldiers from Camp Sherman, all organized to be the profile of President Woodrow Wilson. The photograph was taken from an individual standing on top of a tower, and this photograph was later sent to the president himself, who I'm sure appreciated it very much. So if you're interested in more local history about Ohio's soldiers in the First World War, you can venture down south to Chillicothe and visit Hopewell Culture National Historic Park. There's also quite a bit at the Ohio Historical Connection. The National World War I Museum is located in Kansas City, Missouri. Now, the cultural consequences of the United States of America building up its military to include 4 million men, men who are mostly in their 20s and 30s, men who otherwise would have a job in the United States of America, the cultural consequences of this cannot be underestimated. Think about where these men are coming from. The United States of America in the early 20th century was a manufacturing giant. Not a majority of young people went on to college. Most of them just took a job out of high school, even if they completed high school. The culture was very different in the early 20th century than it is today in the early 21st century. You did not necessarily have to go to college. Most people didn't. And most of the jobs in the early 20th century were in manufacturing in urban areas. So most of the men who were being conscripted into the military are coming from these manufacturing jobs. So when the men leave these jobs to go into the military, who steps in to their place? Who fills in in these manufacturing jobs that are located in mostly urban areas in the north? Who is going to take the who are which group of Americans are going to take this job? So, some of these jobs are taken by women. These are traditionally not female jobs, but during wartime Sometimes women were hired for these jobs. And I'll talk a lot about women in manufacturing during World War II. But for World War I, the group that was hired to fill in to these jobs that's most significant to talk about were African-American men. Because this created one of the largest demographic shifts in American history. I have heard that it was the Greatest demographic shift in American history from one particular book that I'll talk about in a minute, but I'm going to be conservative and just say it was one of the biggest demographic shifts in American history. So by demographic shift, I mean a movement of people from one place to another. Okay, African Americans. Before World War I, the overwhelming majority of African Americans in our country lived in the South, mostly in rural areas mostly as sharecroppers. This takes us all the way back to our lecture on Reconstruction. In between the Reconstruction era and before the advent of World War I, most African Americans lived in rural areas in the South and were sharecroppers. It's important to remember that they lived segregated from whites and oppressed by the greater white society. There were Jim Crow laws that forced them to be segregated and deprive them of economic and political opportunities. This was reinforced by the 1896 court case, Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson. And so African Americans in the South were legally oppressed people. And then they also had to live in fear of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. If any African American attempted to change the system, they might be intimidated, brutalized, killed, or lynched as Ida B. Wells reported on 
in her book, Southern Horrors. Ida B. Wells is still around at this point in time in history, by the way. She was still actively involved during the First World War. Okay, so now this demographic shift. If you are a black person living in the South, life is not good. You live under Jim Crow oppression. Up North, the owners of factories in urban areas, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Boston, New York City, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, Michigan, other urban areas where there are manufacturing jobs and other jobs where the white men that once worked in these positions are now going off to war, you need somebody to, fulfill, to fill these jobs. And for the first time in all of American history, there was an opportunity for blacks in the South to leave the South and to go elsewhere in the United States of America, mostly to the urban areas of the North. Those that could took advantage of that situation, and there was an exodus of African Americans from the South to mostly the North, but sometimes to the West. And this massive demographic shift was called, and is still called, the Great Migration. The Great Migration began during the First World War. And I've seen various years as, in terms of when historians said it began. I have down here on this screen 1916, but that's a little flexible. And then when it ends, also relatively flexible, but I'm sticking with one historian that I think is the best historian on the Great Migration. And I'll say the, the end year is 1970, 1970. So in between the years 1916 and 1970, there is a mass exodus a mass leaving of African Americans from the South to mostly to the North, but some to the West. And this exodus, this emigration of African Americans out of the South will have an indel indelible impact on American culture. We will forever be changed by this great migration. And I will in future lectures be referring back to this great migration. Uh, one very important future Ohio Ohioan I will talk about who was part of the great migration was a young man named Jesse Owens. His dad was a sharecropper. They moved from Alabama to Cleveland, Ohio. He was very much a part of this, this great migration, as were millions of other African Americans. So let, let's take the city of Cleveland, Ohio, for example, today, or any other major urban area in the North, Detroit, Chicago, New York City. If we could go back in time to the year 1900, relatively, there weren't that many African Americans living in those large urban areas in the North. But then, starting in the 1920s, there were significant African-American neighborhoods that started developing in the North. Now, as you hear this story, it's easy to oversimplify it and to think that, well, the reason why African-Americans were moving to the South, to the North, from the South to the North, was because there was less racism in the North. And, of course, in the South, you had the KKK and Jim Crow and all that. Please understand that that is a very superficial and largely inaccurate description of what African Americans experienced, because there were not a lot of white people up in these northern urban areas that were going to welcome a massive influx of African Americans into their neighborhood with open arms. African Americans met a lot of resistance in the north. They were invited to come and take these manufacturing jobs, these African-American men were invited from the South to the North to take these manufacturing jobs because many of the factory owners could justify paying them less because they're black. And then when they moved into neighborhoods, because they were black, they were charged higher rent. Frequently, African-Americans would establish their own neighborhoods within the major metropolitan areas, uh, like the South side of Chicago or in Manhattan, the neighborhood of Harlem, and these particular neighborhoods became synonymous with black and, be, and these being black neighborhoods. And as these neighborhoods were transformed from being predominantly white to being predominantly black, this transformation didn't always go smoothly. And sometimes there were even race riots that erupted in the North. So it's not like African Americans were moving from a place where there was all of this racism to a place where there, were, there was no racism. There's racism everywhere. But outside of the sharecropping system of the South, there was elsewhere in America the beginnings of economic opportunity or what was perceived or hoped for would be economic opportunity. So this was the Great Migration, one of the 
greatest demographic shifts in American history. It certainly has this incredibly indelible, powerful impact on uh, American culture. We would be a very different country if the Great Migration did not happen. And it happened in part because of the First World War. In the year 2010, the American journalist and historian Isabel Wilkerson published the book The Warmth of Other Suns. This is the only significant book that I've read on the Great Migration. It's probably the greatest book of on the Great Migration. It's it's certainly the most celebrated and significant in recent American history. This book is a fantastic book of nonfiction. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson, the author, she collected all of these stories of African Americans who fled the South and to different places in the North. And then part of her research was retracing their journey, so actually doing what they did, traveling from the South to wherever it is they went, so that she could tell their stories as precisely as possible. And one thing that I certainly took away from The Warmth of the Other Sons is just how difficult that journey was. Even as horrible as things were in the South, it's a daring thing. It's always a daring thing, no matter who you are, to sell your home, quit your job, and try to make a break for it in hopes for a better life. I mean, just like the story of stories of immigrants coming to the United States of America, how daring and bold of a move that was. In this book, The Warmth of Other Sons, you really get a strong sense of how daring it was for many African Americans to leave everything that was familiar behind and go to, I mean, really what felt like a foreign country. I mean, another person who participated in the Great Migration was the jazz musician, Louis Armstrong. And Louis Armstrong came from arguably a big city, New Orleans, Louisiana. But he went from New Orleans, Louisiana to Chicago, and he got off the train in Chicago looked at all these skyscrapers all around him. For him, it was a completely different world. He was a young man. He was scared to death. He's got to find a home, get a job. Now, lucky for Louis Armstrong, he was a very young man, and he was single. The Warmth of Other Sons tells the stories of families. They've got to make this trip. They have to survive this trip, which is going to last several days for most of them, be it on train or in a car or on a bus. They've got to get north, find a home, find some place to live and find food, money. They, this is the story of the struggle of survival. Uh, Isabel Wilkerson tells the story of one man who got in trouble with the law. He was afraid the KKK was going to kill him. So he literally had himself wrapped in a box and mailed up north. This man literally was curled up in a wooden box with a few holes to breathe out of, all for the hope of a better life. This is an, an amazing book, if ever you're interested. All right. So now that we've got this huge army that we're building up, it takes them one year to train them. So we declare war in 1917, but we're really not shipping any soldiers over, at least not en masse, until 1918. But then how do we get them across the ocean? After all, the Germans have U-boats. They've already declared unrestricted submarine warfare. What's to stop the Germans for just bang, bang, shooting all these boats out of the Atlantic and sinking all of our soldiers that we've spent a year to train? The United States has to develop a method of eluding the U-boats. So we do. We came up with the relatively successful convoy system. So what was the convoy system? The convoy system worked like this. We had groups of boats that traveled together. So we're not gonna have single isolated boats going out into the Atlantic alone, no way. They're gonna travel in groups. Traveling in groups is good because if a U-boat shows up and daringly tries to strike at one of our boats, we've got several other boats that can fire back at the U-boat. So traveling in packs is going to work for the United States of America. The other thing we, are, we do, if you can take a look at this old image here, the convoy, convoys would be flanked on either side by destroyers. These American battleships that would travel in a zigzag fashion. Now, why would they travel in a zigzag fashion? After all, that takes longer. Why not just go in a straight line? Well, these destroyers that were essentially protecting the convoy ships by traveling in a zigzag fashion, they would be throwing off the U-boat's ability to accurately aim and fire at the destroyer or the convoy as a whole because it would take several minutes, anywhere between 8 and 15 minutes, for the U-boat to, lo- to line up its sights on the boat to take aim and to fire the torpedo. So if every eight minutes or so that destroyer changed direction, 
it would throw off the U-boat's ability to accurately fire at the, at the boat. So by traveling in groups and traveling in a zigzag fashion, or at least having the flanking destroyers travel in a zigzag fashion, this largely protected the American ships from U-boats. And we get our soldiers to France. Once in France, the American soldiers feel like we are giving back to the French people who helped us win the American Revolution. Yes, the United States of America would have never won its revolution against Great Britain back in the 1770s and early 1780s had it not been for French intervention. The French military, and in particular the French Navy at the Battle of Yorktown, helped us to defeat the British and win our independence. Famously, there was the Marquis de Lafayette, who was friends with George Washington, a high-ranking French aristocrat who helped us win the war, Marquis de Lafayette. So when the American troops showed up in France, they chanted Lafayette, Lafayette, Lafayette. Who is the commander, the highest ranking general for the United States of America in World War I? Well, it's this guy. You remember him, General John Blackjack Pershing. Now, when the Americans show up, the British and the French, who've already been fighting the Germans for nearly four years, simply wanted to absorb the American soldiers into their armies. After all, they already had their positions, they already had their trenches, seems like an easy thing to do, there's already allied military commanders, just have the Americans show up in support of the British and the French, who have already been fighting this war for four years. General Blackjack Pershing puts his foot down and says, no, the Americans will not be absorbed into the French and British armies. We're going to fight in our own separate units under the American flag. The British and the French attempted to argue, but we already have our positions, our commanders. We're already in place. It would just be much easier if the Americans were absorbed into the British and the French armies. To which General Pershing's response was, yes, you're already in place. You're already fighting the Germans. But how is that working out for you? General Pershing is bringing the Americans in with all of our gusto, all of our doughboy enthusiasm, and a whole lot of cockiness. We Americans are going to fight independently and win this war for you. So 1918 is the last year of this war, and here's how things go down. I've got two very simple maps for you guys. The first shows you in the most general way what happened in the first half of 1918, and the second map shows you in the most general way what happened in the second half of 1918. This map that you're looking at right now represents the first half of 1918. Germany has successfully ended the war on the Eastern Front. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, ending the war with Russia, was signed in November of 1918, or I'm sorry, November 1917, after the successful Communist Revolution. So, Throughout the end of 1917 and the beginning of 1918, Germany is going to try its best to win this war. Who cares that the Americans have declared war and that they are now involved? The Germans don't believe the Americans can fight. The Germans are going to send all of their resources, all of their men, to the Western Front. And in the spring of 1918, Germany is going to launch the Spring Offensive. They are going to let loose hell on the Western Front. And they do. Beginning of spring of 1918, there is no more trench warfare. This war is now moving again. And the Germans are winning. At the beginning of summer of 1918, they've pressed all the way into France. They're within 30 miles of the capital city of Paris. They are so close that the Germans, or the German artillery, can hit the suburbs of Paris. They are so close that one million Parisian citizens run away from the city. At this point in time, it seems like Germany is going to win this war. But there's two things that are going on that are undermining Germany's ability to win. One is that the German people are starving. There's a sense that in within Germany that this war is futile, even if they do win, what is to be gained? And inspired by the Russian Revolution, there are now communist revolutionaries in Germany trying to overthrow the government there. And, and it doesn't matter when in history you are after uh, the middle of the 19th century. Whenever you have a communist revolution, it's always because you have the majority of people living in poverty 
and wealth being concentrated in the hands of a minority and there being no middle class. And that was the situation in Germany. There were so many people living in poverty and there was so much of a loss of life. There was so much desperation among the German people that they were, at, when you get to the summer of 1918, and especially into the fall of 1918, you have communist revolutionaries springing up throughout Germany, in particular Berlin and the uh, big uh, German city in the south of Germany, Munich. So, okay, so that's undermining Germany's ability to win, is this revolutionary activity that's happening within Germany. And then the other thing is the United States of America. We've shown up. So beginning late summer of 1918, and here's the second map with a second arrow, the Allies are attacking Germany. The front begins to move again, and this time Germany is playing defense. Germany is retreating, retreating, retreating until we get to November of 1918, when the Allied armies have made it to the Rhine River on the western border of Germany. And now the German government has to make a decision. Do we continue to fight on German soil, or do we just give up? This change in direction, this shift from Germany winning and getting so close to winning, 30 miles from Paris, to Germany now losing and retreating back rather quickly, our country can take a lot of credit for this. That and the fact that there were communist revolutionaries within Germany at the same time. The most significant offensive, it was more than just one battle, it lasted from September into November, was the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. This was the major battle that the, the Americans waged against the Germans. It began in September of 1918. There were about a half, of American, a half a million American troops that were engaged in active combats immediately against the Germans. There were 26,000 American deaths in this one offensive, over 120,000 casualties. This would be about half of the deaths that Americans would lose in the entirety of the First World War was during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. One impressive statistic that I learned just a couple of years ago for the 100th, uh, well, the centennial of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, so I learned this in 2018, the opening salvo of the Americans, we fired at the Germans in one half of an hour the exact uh, same amount of artillery that America used in the entirety of the Civil War, North and South combined. So in other words, the number of cannonballs and bullets that we fired in the entirety of the American Civil War, we fired that at the Germans within a half an hour with the opening salvo of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in 1918. And that just gives you a feel for just how horrible and awful and how industrialized the First World War was. But we made quick gains against the Germans. We moved quick. We captured a lot of Germans. We even captured 33,000 Germans in two days. In late September of 1918, we're moving fast. Here's an actual picture of American troops manning a machine gun during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. The Americans have arrived to help win World War I for the Allies. So now, in an attempt to humanize this war a little bit, I want to step away from talking about the American military as a whole, and talk about several individual soldiers and a particular regiment of soldiers in the First World War. And the first is this man, Alvin York. Alvin York will probably become the single most famous soldier at the end of the First World War, at least for the Americans. Him and Eddie Rickenbacker. So who was Alvin York? Interestingly, Alvin York was an individual who didn't believe in war and he didn't believe in fighting. Alvin York grew up in rural, rural Tennessee. His family, they were subsistence farmers, which meant that they didn't go to restaurants or grocery stores. They ate only what they made themselves. They were extraordinarily poor. And because of that, Alvin York, at a very young age, had to learn how to shoot his own food. So he was a pretty good hunter. That's a skill that's going to serve him well during the First World War. But he had a very unfortunate life. He was very much a poor boy. There was no public education system that he could enjoy like you have. According to him, he only got the equivalent of about a third grade education. And he will spend most of his life after the war 
working to build schools and provide education for other poor kids in Tennessee so that they could have the advantages that he did not. So when the war broke out, Alvin York had no interest in fighting because he didn't believe as a Christian that it was ever right in any circumstance for an individual to kill another human being, even during war. Alvin York was a very religious man. He wasn't always religious. As a young man, he was a little bit of a, a little bit of a hellion. He drank a lot and even got into a few bar fights. And then one of his close buddies actually died in a bar fight. And then he fell in love with a beautiful young woman. And she was a devout Christian. And her dad would not let Alvin date her unless Alvin himself was a devout Christian. So because of his love for this woman and also because... I mean, he lost a close buddy in a bar fight. Alvin decided to clean himself up, become a good Christian, and go to church, and he ends up marrying this young woman. And Alvin York embraced this denomination of Christianity, which did not believe in fighting. But when 1917 rolled around, he did his duty. He went, he registered for the draft, and he was drafted into the military. He went to basic training, which was a little bit of culture shock for him because he'd only lived in rural Tennessee. And when he's in basic training, he's in with all these immigrants from the big cities. He's feeling weird about this war. He doesn't want to go and kill anybody. And his superior officers at basic training actually allowed him to go home and really to think about if he wanted to fight in this war or not. He actually had the opportunity to back out. So he actually spends a lot of time in prayer, talking to God, and he decides that it's his duty as an American to fight in what he believes is a good cause. So he decides ultimately he will fight. And Alvin York was in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in October of 1918, and it was the job of his unit to attack German machine gun nest. And so they were charging up this hill to capture German machine gunners. They were expecting for American artillery behind them to cover them, to fire into the German line, to hopefully kill the Germans before they got there. But something went wrong and the American artillery wasn't firing. So Alvin York's brigade... They're charging up under heavy German fire. The commander of Alvin York's unit, he got killed. And so York assumed command. And he led the charge. They took the Germans by surprise. And Alvin York's skill as a hunter in rural Tennessee helped him out here. When the Germans attacked him, he was able to one by one fire shots off to pick them off. Supposedly, Alvin York killed around 25 Germans, surprised the rest, and captured 132 Germans. And for this act of heroism, of assuming command when his superior officer was killed, leading a charge into battle, greatly outnumbered, killing 25 Germans, capturing 132 of them, Alvin York was awarded the Medal of Honor and quickly became a distinguished hero when he came back home. One of the most famous American magazines at the time the Saturday Evening Post, ran an article celebrating what Alvin York did during the First World War and also exaggerating exactly what he did, claiming that he had captured 35 machine gun nests, which was not true, and also downplaying the role of the seven other men who were with Alvin York following him going into battle, making it seem that York did it all by himself. So when York comes home to all of this celebration, he is immediately approached by movie producers who want to turn his story into a major motion picture, and York refuses. He doesn't like anything that glorifies war. However, he does use his fame and his celebrity status in his local community of Tennessee to create a philanthropic organization to build schools to provide the poor people of Tennessee with an education. But then 20 years later, in the early 1940s, he finally allows for a Hollywood film to be made about his life and his actions in the First World War. The name of the movie was called Sergeant York. Alvin York personally said, I want to choose the actor who plays me. And he chose an actor, a very famous actor by the name of Gary Cooper. And York served as an advisor on the film. York was granted a whole lot of money for this film, the majority of which went to, you guessed it, the schools for the poor children of Tennessee. York didn't have much of an education himself. Again, before he went to the First World War, he had a third grade education. After the war, he completed his education and also got a teaching and administrative license so that he could both teach classes and run schools. And that's a brief overview of the famous World War I life 
of Alvin York. So now let me move on to a particular regiment from the First World War. This is the, this is the 369th. They were an all African American unit. Their nickname was the Harlem Hellfighters. So African Americans during the First World War. Blacks were allowed to be in the United States Army. However, they were in their own separate all black regiment. They were all under a white commander and usually they were given subservient assignments such as being cooks or setting up or striking camps or cleaning latrines. So the racism in the United States of America was reflected in the structure of the military. The blacks were serving the whites in the early 20th century. But the 369th found itself in a very different position. And here's why. So you remember when the United States military shows up in France and General Pershing says the Americans are going to fight on their own. We are not going to be absorbed, in, absorbed into the French or the British military. We're going to do our own thing. That was mostly true, except for the 369th. General Pershing gave the 369th all-black regiment to France. The 369th asked for active combat duty. The French gave it to them. The 369th are going on the front lines to face the Germans. 369th started fighting the Germans before the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in the summer of 1918, and they fought all the way up through the armistice in early November of 1918. The 369th was in active combat for 169 days, more than any other American unit. 169 days. I did a little bit of math. That is, near, that is over three and a half months. That's nearly a half a year of being in active combat. The 369th was also the first unit of American soldiers that made it to the Rhine River in Germany. The 369th had the most combat experience. The 369th had none of them taken hostage by the Germans. It's also worth mentioning that the 369th Regiment had their own band, and most of the American regiments had their own band. Musicians within the regiment who would play music to inspire the troops. But the 369th Regiment had jazz mu musicians. Jazz is a predominantly African-American musical art form, and the 369th, with their jazz band, which was led by a musician named James Europe, they introduced jazz to France in the late 19-teens, and the French loved it, and they embraced jazz, so much so that throughout the remainder of the 20th century, a lot of African-American jazz musicians who are just get sick and tired of the discrimination in the United States of America end up moving to Paris. But okay, so the 369th, most days of active combat of any American soldiers in World War I, the first unit of Americans to reach the Rhine River in Germany, not a single one of them take it hostage. Do any of them receive the Medal of Honor? No. And when they come back home, they are not allowed to march in the same victory parades as the rest of the American soldiers, because they are black. So here is the story of incredible military heroism and complete racism and genuine disregard for that military, her military heroism. Now, even though they were denied being able to march in the parades with the other American soldiers, they were able to organize their own victory parade in New York City. It started in downtown Manhattan, and they marched all the way up north to the neighborhood of Harlem. Now, the Americans didn't bestow upon them any medal medals of honor, but if you take a look at this picture, and you look at, uh, and this picture was taken at the end of the war, you might notice that all of the soldiers on here are decorated with a cross the two guys sitting up top in the middle there, you see the cross is very prominently on their chest. That cross is the French war cross. It's called the Croix de Guerre. Croix de Guerre, the war cross in French. And it's the French equiv equivalent of the Medal of Honor. So the French bestowed their highest military honor upon the American 369th Regiment. Now, of all the men that fought in the 369th, Henry Johnson is probably the most famous. Henry Johnson and one other man from the 369th left their trench under the cover of darkness and they advanced into no man's land, crawling into a crater in no man's land. Henry Johnson did this with one other member of the 369th. So these two men were alone in their foxhole when the Germans attacked. They come rushing across no man's land. There were 30 Germans in this attack. 
the other American soldier gets injured and cannot fight, Henry Johnson begins firing shots into the Germans, throwing grenades into the Germans. The Germans see him and they try to take him out. The Germans rush into the little trench where Henry Johnson is, and Henry Johnson goes into hand-to-hand -hand combat with these Germans. He pulled out his knife and started fighting with his knife. His own foot was stabbed, giving him a painful and permanent war injury. The Germans had tried to grab and drag away the other American soldier. Henry Johnson prevented that from happening from def by defending his friend while he's also fighting off the Germans. In the end, Henry Johnson killed four Germans, and the remainder retreated back, thus giving the Americans the opportunity to advance against the Germans. Because of his acts of heroism, Henry Johnson was actually the first American soldier to receive the Croix de Guerre. And you'll see here I labeled it on this particular picture of Henry Johnson. But, of course, even though Henry Johnson received France's highest military honor, he receives no honor from the United States of America. And sadly, because of his war injury to his foot, he can't hold down a job. He can't get a job. There's no type of veteran's assistance at this point in time in American history. And Henry Johnson dies penniless. He died in the year 1929 of tuberculosis. Now, he never received the Medal of Honor in his lifetime, but in the year 2015, President Barack Obama did posthumously award Henry Johnson with the American Medal of Honor. And for what it's worth, one of Theodore Roosevelt's son, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., referred to Henry Johnson as the bravest American soldier in World War I. All right. So the story of one last soldier from the First World War. Marcelino Cerna was a Mexican who crossed into the United States of America to live in the town of Tornillo, Texas, which is not too far away from El Paso in West Texas. He was not an American citizen and World War I broke out and he enlisted into the United States Army. He was told, you do not have to fight for the United States Army you are not an American. He said, I want to fight for the United States of America. And if you take a look at his picture here and look at all of those medals on his chest, Marcelino Cerna became the most decorated Texan soldier in the First World War, including, you might be able to notice this if you're from, slightly familiar with this very famous medal, on his chest there, there is the um, Purple Heart. Uh, this is the, You are awarded the Purple Heart if you are injured in battle. And then the medal that you see there under his name, that is the Distinguished Service Cross. That is the second highest medal to the Medal of Honor. And so how did he get all these medals? What did Marcelino Cerna do? Well, he kept volunteering to be this advance scout to go in front of the American front lines. So in other words, he would individually go onto no man's land go towards the Germans to scout out their trenches. And when he did this, he just started fighting the Germans. During one of these individual reconnaissance missions, he just goes into a German trench, kills 30 men, and gets 12 Germans to surrender to him, and he's alone, just one American. You know, when I think of these soldiers like Marcelino Serna, Alvin York, Henry Johnson, for me personally, I don't know if they're extraordinarily brave or extraordinarily stupid. These were just bold and daring and irrational things to do. These were all three individuals who certainly placed their own lives beneath their service to their country. These were all extraordinary acts of bravery and of courage. And as I tell the, their stories, I wonder, would I, who have never been in combat before, or never been anywhere remotely close to, a, in, in a, to being in a situation like this, would I have the courage to do even just a little of what these guys did? Just extraordinary bravery. So Marcelino Cerna. To honor the legacy of Marcelino Cerna, there is now an American border crossing station in Tornillo, Texas. This is where Marcelino Cerna himself crossed over into the United States. And this is very near where he lived. And so to honor him as a Mexican who came into the United States to fight for the United States... In the First World War, this border crossing station was recently renamed the Marcelino Cerna Point of Entry in Tornilla, Texas. And here's his name on the, or near the entryway, 
to the United States Customs and Border Building as it is today. And it's kind of hard to read here, but it does say the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, Marcelino Cerna, point of entry, Tornilla, Texas. So I think if you need the image of American heroism in World War I, here you go. These three faces, York, Johnson, and Cerna. I think these three individuals represent the best and the bravest of all the doughboys. But let's now turn to the American military as a whole as we return to the fall of 1918 and the Allied forces forcing the Germans to retreat back into Germany. And so we get to November of 1918. The German high command is trying to make the decision. Do we continue to fight? Do we allow the Allies to invade Germany? And now we have to fight on German soil and potentially lose ground to the Allies? Or do we negotiate for a surrender. And also remember, at this point in time, there are communist revolutionaries rising up in Germany. Also, some German soldiers are refusing to fight. In early November 1918, there was the Kiel Mutiny. Kiel is a port city in northern Germany, and German soldiers in the German Navy were given a suicide mission to go and fight the British, and they simply refused to do it. They revolted, they refused to fight, and if you look in the back left of this picture, you might also notice that the, that the Kiel mutineers were waving the revolutionary all-red flag. They were joining the communist revolutionaries who were trying to take over Germany. In the capital of Germany, Berlin, this was known as the Spartacus Rebellion. So the German high command, feeling like they had no other option, met with the high command of the French and the British, in a train near the front lines and agreed to an armistice. Now, an armistice is not a peace treaty. An armistice is a ceasefire. It's the agreement to stop hostilities. And the armistice was agreed upon, very famously, at 11 a.m., the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. So at 11 a.m. of 11-11-1918, the war is over. This war was so devastating and it took so many lives that this was such an important moment that it was remembered throughout Europe and the United States and the world as Armistice Day. And every year on November the 11th, Armistice Day was acknowledged by all the major combatants of the First World War, France, Britain, United States of America. It was a day to remember all of those who fought in the First World War. In the year 1954, we quit calling it Armistice Day, and we in the United States began calling it Veterans Day. 1954 was about 10 years after the end of World War II, and we renamed the, this holiday so that it was clear we were honoring all veterans, not just First World War veterans. And still today, of course, 11-11 is Veterans Day, and it's always important to thank those veterans that you know on 11-11, even if all you do is just say thanks. Now, the First World War was devastating for the United States of America. Over 53,000 soldiers died. And remember, we really only fought for about six months. So that's a pretty high death toll for only a half a year of fighting. You can compare this to, say, the Vietnam War. The United States was involved in the Vietnam War for 20 years, but really the heavy fighting was 10 years of those 20 years in the Vietnam War. In the Vietnam War, we lost 58,000 soldiers. So 58,000 soldiers in the Vietnam War, most of which died in, over the course of 10 years. And then in World War I, 53,000, pretty close number. And we lost those in a period of about a half a year. It was devastating for the United States of America, but not nearly as devastating for us as it was the other allies. The British lost three quarter of a million men. The French lost over 1.1 million men, and the Russians lost approximately 1.7 million men. For the Europeans, the First World War killed off a whole generation of young men. And then let's add Germany to the mix. Germany lost approximately 1.8 million men. These are numbers too high to comprehend. You cannot underestimate the emotional devastation the First World War had on the Europeans. I mean, as horrible as it was for us, it was catastrophic for the Europeans. 
And these are, of course, only the principal countries that I've been talking about. Serbia, the Ottomans, the Italians, all of them had equally catastrophic figures too. But it's over. November 1918, it's over. The hell is over. And why did it end? Well, because of German revolutionaries and because of us, the United States of America. Had we not entered into this war, Germany would have won. We tipped the balance. Now, how do the British and French look upon the Americans? Well, they're like, thank you very much. We know that you helped us win this war. However, we had been fighting it for four years prior to you showing up. The Americans were really late on the scene. And the British and the French don't feel all that keen on letting the Americans take a lot of credit for this. But at the same time, they acknowledge that had it not been for the Americans, Paris would have fallen to the German military, which places this man in an incredible position in history. President Woodrow Wilson is going to be the first president in American history to travel to Europe while he is president, and he is going to meet the prime ministers of France and Britain to come up with a peace treaty. Now, Woodrow Wilson wanted to make this the war to end all wars. He made this about a war to fight for freedom and to deliver freedom and democracy to all of the people of Europe. He said the United States of America wants neither land nor money. We are here to free the people of Europe and to make sure that there will never be another war like this ever again. President Woodrow Wilson should have a lot of clout with the leaders of the other two victorious countries, Britain and France. He could show up and say, we, the Americans, we won this war, and we are going to determine the peace treaty to bring peace on earth. So President Woodrow Wilson goes to France and specifically meets with, well, the prime ministers. Uh, just looking at this picture here, on the left-hand side of the picture with the big walrus-like mustache, that is Georges Clemenceau. He was the French prime minister. On the right is the British prime minister. His name was David Lloyd George. And it's these three men who are going to determine, well, the future of the world. World War I is over. These are the representatives from the three big victorious powers. They were informally known as the Big Three. And in very few other times in history have three individuals wielded such amazing power over the future of humanity. And it's fun to think about if you were in their shoes and you had the opportunity to create a peace treaty for pretty much the entire world, what type of peace treaty would you create? What would you do to create a lasting peace for the future of the world, especially if you were Woodrow Wilson and your goal was to create an eternal peace and you now have the opportunity to do that, what would be your plan? All right, so Woodrow Wilson dwelled long and hard on this question. How do I create a permanent eternal peace for, the rem for, for as long as can be? Eternity seems like a long stretch, but for a long, long time, how can we create a peace? How can we create peace around the world that will last for as long as possible? Okay, and here's what he came up with. Wilson shows up to the Paris Peace Conference, which took place in the famous Versailles Palace, which is about 10 miles outside of downtown Paris. It was the seat of French royalty back when France still had kings, the Versailles Palace. Okay, so these three men and Woodrow Wilson... <laughs> These three men, including Woodrow Wilson, they show up at Versailles Palace for the Paris Peace Talks. Wilson shows up with a list of 14 points, 14 objectives that he has to create a lasting peace. And so this is the famous document, Wilson's 14 points. Now, of these 14 points, I would like to identify for you four major ideas that are contained in these 14 points. These are Wilson's ideas for how to create a permanent peace. Okay, so first, he says that this should be a war without victors. Okay, a war without victors. What does that mean? It means this. It means there are no victors in a war. War is painful and devastating for all, and that the people who fought in the war had nothing to do with, this, with starting the war. The German soldiers fought for Germany because they had to, but they had no say in starting this war. And the war was devastating for all, so 
the time has come for forgiveness. If there are no victors, then nobody should be humiliated as a loser. Now, Wilson is directing this at Britain and France. There to let go any desire for vengeance against Germany. Do not humiliate Germany. Do not demand land from Germany. Do not demand war reparations from Germany. To have a lasting peace, we must first forgive our enemies. So if you remember early on when I was talking about Woodrow Wilson and his rise to the presidency, he, ident he identified himself as a Christian humanist, and this would be very much a part of his Christian faith. Remember, he came from a family of ministers. This idea, which is central in Christianity, of forgiving your enemies. And I think a lot of Woodrow Wilson biographers and scholars see a lot of his Christianity in this idea of having a war without victors. Okay, so that's the first central idea in Wilson's 14 points. The second idea is self-determination. Okay, what does that mean? Here he's talking about nations. He's talking about groups of people in Europe. In Europe, you have these powerful empires like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the German Empire, the Russian Empire, and their empires. And you know what the definition of empire is. It's when one nation controls other nations. And so take, for example, Poland. Poland is a country in Eastern Europe. It didn't exist because it had been gobbled up by these other imperial powers. Russia had a part of Poland. Germany had a part of Poland. Austria had a part of Poland. Well, self-determination means this. All those nations go free. There are now no longer empires. There are going to be countries that are nations. So, the Polish people have Poland, the German people have Germany, the Austrian people have Austria, and then there are other Eastern European countries. Uh, the Hungarian people get Hungary. Now, there were countries that were sort of combined. Uh, there were two groups of people, the Czechs and the Slovaks. They had a united country called Czechoslovakia, but the combined Czechoslovak people got Czechoslovakia. So these individual nations, these individual groups of people who have a common culture, a common language, they get their own country. That's self-determination. The other aspect of self-determination is all of these people get a say in their own government. Europe is to become universally a democracy. No more kings, no more emperors. That's done. Just like we Americans got rid of a monarchy when we had a revolution in the 1770s, so too must the monarchies of Europe go away. Or if there are to be kings and queens, like in, say, England, for example, there are to be constitutional monarchies, so they don't really get a chance to rule. They're just sort of symbolic. They get their castles and their palaces, and that's it. They don't actually get to run the government. So that's the second big idea in Wilson's 14 points. Self-determination, which is countries go free from their imperial rulers and all people in Europe have a democratic vote. Europe is going to become a continent of nations and those nations are all democracy. Okay, I hope that makes sense. The third idea that was inherent in Wilson's 14 points was for European nations to let go of their colonies. In other words, white Europeans are not allowed to rule the world. In Wilson's eyes, by the time we get to the early 20th century, European colonialism has proven to be evil. First of all, this European war spread to a world war because these, country, these European countries all had colonies all over the world. So that's in large part why this European war became a world war. But then also, Many people argued that World War I was the result of European colonization because the European countries, in trying to conquer the entire world, began jockeying for power with each other. And there were several times where European countries almost went to war. European countries almost went to war because they were competing for land elsewhere. Uh, specifically, in the year 1885 in Berlin, Germany, there was a Berlin conference where all the European powers got together to figure out how to divide up Africa. And that was to stop a war so that they didn't go to war with each other over who got what in Africa. 
But then also Woodrow Wilson looked upon colonization as evil. I mean, in that Berlin conference, for example, there wasn't a single African represented to say, hey, you can't take over our country. Colonization represented extreme social Darwinism, the attitude of might makes right, and of these white European nations attempting to conquer and rule over the entire world. Wilson argues in his third big idea in his 14 points for the European countries to let go of their colonies. All right, so that's the third thing. The fourth and final big idea in Wilson's 14 points that I point out is Wilson argues that there should be an international representative body for all the countries in the world. He called this representative body a League of Nations. And the League of Nations is actually based on a very simple idea. And that idea is this. Before you fight, talk about your problems. It's an idea that I think we try to teach children in kindergarten. Use your words, not your fists. So what the League of Nations would be was a place, a single place, where representatives from every country in the world could come to discuss their issues, and the other countries could weigh in. It would be a format in which adults who represent different countries can come and talk about the problems that their country is facing. So had there been a League of Nations in the summer of 1914 and the Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian Empire got assassinated, instead of this just being a conflict between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia, in which hostile letters were exchanged between the two countries and then eventually war broke out, there could be a the League of Nations would be a place where both of those principal countries could have talked about their the issue, talk about what happened, and the rest of the world would also have the opportunity to chime in to create a solution by which we could avoid war. So that fourth and final big idea, the creation of an international organization that represents every country in the entire world, a League of Nations. Last big idea in Wilson's 14 points. All right, so there it is. I don't know if that's at all similar to what popped up into your mind in terms of you know how you would create a lasting peace, but those were Wilson's ideas. That's what he walked into Versailles Palace with. That was his idea for how to create a lasting peace to make World War I the war to end all wars. But the problem was France and Britain had suffered so much they wanted vengeance. They wanted Germany to pay. And their countries are in debt. And they owe money to the United States of America. So Prime Minister Clemenceau from France, Prime Minister David Lloyd George from Britain, they want to rub Germany's nose in its own loss. And they need money, 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 money. Their countries are broke and struggling. So in the end, how does it turn out? Wilson has to convince these other two men that he has the peace plan that works. Did the other two buy it? Do Wilson's 14 points become the peace treaty that ends World War I? Well, not exactly. Wilson, our intellectual professor turned president, he was not shrewd enough of a statesman to be able to essentially get these other two men to share his vision for how to create world peace. So in the end, we have the Treaty of Versailles. Did the Treaty of Versailles take into account a war without victors? No. The Treaty of Versailles actually had within it a war guilt clause in which Germany accepted the full responsibility of the war, stating that Germany had provoked the war by invading France through neutral Belgium, and Germany had to own that with a war guilt clause. Because there was a war guilt clause, Germany had to agree to pay for war reparations, otherwise known as indemnity. So Germany had to say, okay, we started the war and we're willing to pay for the war. So Germany has to accept paying France and Britain billions of dollars, what would be the equivalent of billions of dollars, to those countries to pay for all the damage that it had done, that Germany had done, and really, this is so Britain and France can collect money 
at a time when both of their countries are financially struggling. All right, what about the whole releasing the colonies? Well, Germany is forced to release their colonies, but guess who takes those colonies? Britain and France. So Britain and France do not let go of their colonies, and in fact, they take more colonies. And then what about this idea of a League of Nations? Well, Britain and France actually agree to that, and pretty much most of the rest of the world thinks that this is a pretty good idea. So, all right, a League of Nations is included in the Treaty of Versailles. Now, if I can touch upon this idea of France and Britain taking on more colonies, I'd like to address what happened to the Ottoman Empire at the end of the war, just because this comes back to haunt the United States of America decades later. So the Ottomans. Now, I haven't talked at all about the Ottomans in this war, except that they were part of the Central Powers. And they were part of the Central Powers. They, they, they allied themselves with the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the German Empire simply because they hated the Russians. And so they joined in to fight their old adversary, the Russians. And that's pretty much it. Now, there were several side treaties around the Treaty of Versailles that dealt with other areas of the world outside of Europe. And there were a couple of treaties that dealt with um, the Ottoman Empire, one of which was the Sykes-Picot Treaty. And the Sykes-Picot Treaty dealt with what we would call today the Middle East. And essentially what happened, in its most general sense, here's what happened. France and Britain are the victors. They look at the modern Middle East. They look at the map of this part of the world. And in a map room in Paris, representatives from both Britain and France got out a pen and began dividing up this region into the areas that the British would control and the areas that the French would control. And they called these areas mandates. Now, the British and the French did not intend to permanently control these mandates. They didn't want to permanently control these areas. They wanted to set up governments in these areas to eventually let them go and to rule themselves with, hopefully, future positive trade relations between these, er re these new countries in the Middle East and Britain and France. So the treaty seems sort of nice. The, Britain and the, the British and the French are going to go over there and help sort of set things up, but then eventually let it go. But here was the problem. As the British and the French created these mandates, and they were literally drawing lines on a map, they didn't take into consideration two important things. One was natural geography. So they drew lines really without consideration to mountain ranges and rivers and other natural geographic features that would be natural boundaries for future countries. So that was kind of just stupid. And the second thing they didn't take into consideration, which was the real issue, were the natural, were, were the natural ethnic groups of these regions. So there are different groups of people that live throughout the Middle East, some of which have a history of antagonism. They don't get along. And what is eventually going to happen is some of these ethnic groups are going to get clumped together in one country. That's going to cause conflict. It's going to make democracy pretty near impossible. And you're going to have the rise of a dictator in these countries because a dictator can keep the various factions from, from fighting. So take, for example, the country of Iraq. The country of Iraq has two different ethnic groups. One are the Sunni Muslims, who are the majority in, the, in Iraq. There were the minority Shia Muslims, who were another ethnic group that were a minority in Iraq. And then in northern Iraq, there is another ethnic group called the Kurds. And they're all forced to be together in one country, and they don't get along. Needless to say, hostilities develop, and eventually you have the rise of a dictator who uses brutal oppression to maintain control. And this was pretty common throughout much of the Middle East, and it could have been avoided had the representatives who created the Sykes-Picot Treaty simply paid attention to the variety of ethnic groups that lived throughout the old Ottoman Empire. Or maybe, arguably, better yet, simply listen to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points and let these groups go free. Allow them to create their own nations. So the Sykes-Picot Treaty created all of these problems in the region of the world that we 
loosely call the Middle East. And in this region, there is a clear sense that these problems were established by Western powers, Britain and France. And then as the 20th century progresses and the United States becomes the single greatest superpower in the world by the time you get to the end of the 20th century in the year 2000, eventually the United States is part of the problem too in creating these problems in the Middle East. Which is why after the 9-11 attacks happened, and the radical terrorist Osama bin Laden claimed responsibility for these attacks, it was very telling that when he claimed responsibility, he said this. What America is tasting now is only a copy of what we have tasted. Our Islamic nation has been tasting the same for more than 80 years of humiliation and disgrace. Its sons killed and their blood spilled, its sanctities desecrated. Okay, now there's a lot in this statement from Osama bin Laden that sort of needs to be explained. There's, for example, no one Islamic nation, but in his mind there is, and it's the Middle East, and he's saying what the United States is experiencing now, which is being under attack and being killed, even civilians being killed, is what we in the Middle East have been experienced for more than 80 years. And he says this in September of 2001. And so many Americans, we had to think when this happened, what, what do you mean 80 years? What was 80 years? Well, you take 2001 and you subtract 80, you get 1921. And he says the same for more than 80 years. So a little over 80 years. And he's talking about the Sykes-Picot Agreement at the end of World War I. He's talking about how Western powers have taken over and exploited and abused the region of the modern Middle East. So this goes to show was World War I the war that ends all wars? No, not at all. Did Britain and France listen to the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson? Well, they listened to it, but they certainly didn't follow his suggestions. And because Britain and France attempted to colonize, sort of, the Middle East, certainly have a lot of control over it, this only leads to future problems, such as the 9-11 attacks. Now, what about that idea of self-determination? Well, the Treaty of Versailles does reflect, for the most part, Wilson's central idea of self-determination. And this might have to do with the fact that both Britain and France are similar to the United States of America and that we have democracies of one variety or another. So look at what the Treaty of Versailles did to the map of Europe. When World War I broke out in 1914, Eastern Europe was pretty much controlled by Russia, Germany, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So Russia backs out of the war in 1917, sacrifices a great deal of its lands in Eastern Europe to Germany, but then Germany and Austro-Hungarian Empire go on to lose the war. And so the big three powers actually carve out of the Middle East countries. These are nations that have always existed. They've just been ruled over by these superpowers, Germany, Austria, the Russians. And so we, now we have new countries in the Middle East, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. Now what's kind of interesting is Serbia, which was an allied power, you don't actually see Serbia on this map because Serbia begins controlling a larger area called Yugoslavia. So essentially Serbia gets its own little empire down there, but uh, let's, not, let's just ignore Yugoslavia here for a moment. Yugoslavia is its own very complex thing throughout the entirety of the 20th century, and I don't want to talk about it here. But all of these countries in Eastern Europe have democracies, and they've never had this before. These people are totally free. Czechoslovakia has never been a country before. They've, and especially the Czech people, have been struggling for this for hundreds of years. So if you see that, if you find Czechoslovakia on the map, and you see that its capital is Prague, if you, go down a, if you go to downtown Prague today, there's a major interstate that runs through downtown Prague, and it's called Woodrow Wilson Interstate. The Czechoslovak people, especially the Czech people, honor and respect Woodrow Wilson for having given them their freedom. And even in the old empires, Germany, Austria, they have gotten rid of their emperors. The Kaiser was forced to flee Germany, had to go to the Netherlands. The ruling family of Austria, the Habsburg family, they, they were banned from Austria, never allowed to return. And now Germany has a democracy and Austria has a democracy. Sounds great. Sounds like this should help create a peaceful Europe. But there was a problem. War reparations. The German people 
the German people who had absolutely no say at the beginning of this war. Those in power, like the Kaiser, they're off and away. Aside from being humiliated, they're not going to personally suffer that much. But the German people, they're going to pay these horrible taxes. They're going to be faced with mounting inflation in their country. They're going to be faced with a horrible, crippling economic depression in the early part of the 1920s and then again in the early part of the 1930s. The German people are overwhelmingly suffering and looking for a way out. The Treaty of Versailles had included this war guilt clause, blaming the German people. It's your fault that World War I happened. Then there were war reparations, which causes massive inflation and massive unemployment in Germany in the, in the early 1920s. And this international humiliation of Germany combined with the poverty of the German people in the early 1920s and then again in the, in the early 1930s, this is part of the reason why Adolf Hitler was able to rise to prominence in Germany and then eventually become the German chancellor and dictator of Germany by 1933. Now, the rise of Adolf Hitler and his fascist, Nazi, racist dictatorship is a very complex one but certainly an important ingredient in his rise to power was how Germany had been humiliated. And, and by humiliated, I mean just German pride was wounded. And then probably most significantly, the war reparations and the collapse of the German economy in the early 1920s. Adolf Hitler came around and he said, I will restore German greatness. Germany will be great and powerful once again, as he himself said, Germany will have its place in the sun. And he promised to cure the economic woes of Germany. So, once again, did the Treaty of Versailles do its job of creating peace on Earth forever and ever? Well, not quite. And maybe, just maybe, had Britain and France listened to Woodrow Wilson's idea of this being a war without victors, if they'd have taken that to heart and not forced war reparations on Germany, and not forced the German delegation to sign the War Guilt Clause, or rather to sign a Treaty of Versailles with a war guilt clause in it, then maybe there wouldn't have been a Hitler in World War II. But hey, while I'm talking about the war reparations thing, I mean, one of the reasons why Britain and France felt that they had to get war reparations from Germany was to pay back the American banks. So it would, it's one thing for the American delegation to show up to Versailles for the Paris peace talks and say, hey, we don't want war reparations from Germany, but Britain and France, you still owe our banks money. And really, it's not even the American delegation that has to do that. The banks in the United States are demanding money from the governments of Britain and France. They owe them. So where are Britain and France going? Where are they going? Where are they going to get this money from? So sort of in an indirect way, the United States of America, or at least the American banks, are putting pressure on Britain and France to take to claim war reparations from Germany, thus humiliating, impoverishing the German people, and helping to lead to the rise of Adolf Hitler within Germany. There are some very important lessons to learn from the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, but what about the League of Nations? Britain and France thought this was going to be a great idea. So the League of Nations is established in the 1920s. The home for the League of Nations is Geneva, Switzerland, a beautiful town on the, at the foot of the Swiss Alps on the French border, Geneva. And representatives from all over the world get to meet to discuss world affairs with the hope that if we can talk about our problems, we, the collective world community, can solve those problems. So this is the world working collectively together to attempt to solve problems. This was Woodrow Wilson's dream. It was the one point from the 14 points that the rest of the world, and specifically Britain and France, agree to make reality the League of Nations. Now, how well did the League of Nations work? Well, not that great because, of course, we have a World War II. Things got different, difficult when there would be a belligerent nation. Like, for example, Italy would be one of these belligerent nations in the 1920s and really the 1930s. Japan would be another one of these belligerent nations, especially in the 1930s. Italy tried to take over parts of Greece, or I'm sorry, not Greece yet. Italy tried to take over parts of the Balkan Peninsula, specifically Albania. They tried to take over Ethiopia, Libya, and Africa. 
And then Japan was trying to take over parts of China. So by belligerent nations, that means they're very hostile nations that are trying to take over other countries. So in the League of Nations, every country chastises Italy and every country chastises Japan. So they can chastise these countries. They can say, you're being bad. You shouldn't do that. You're killing innocent people. But the League of Nations, it has no teeth. And so in the case of Japan, for example, after having other countries tell them, you can't do this, the delegation of Japan just literally stood up and walked out of the League of Nations. Like, we, we don't really care what you think. So the League of Nations uh, historically is looked at as being ineffective because it was unable to stop World War II. So after World War II, when the replacement organization comes along, the United Nations, it will receive more power in its ability to respond to hostile nations. Okay, but in the beginning, the League of Nations was seen as very positive and optimistic that this organization, this collected body of world representatives, it could possibly lead to world peace. In fact, Woodrow Wilson, in the year 1920, received the Nobel Peace Prize specifically because of his idea for the League of Nations. Now, what's incredibly ironic about Wilson conceiving and bringing into existence the League of Nations is how our own country responded to it. Okay, so the League of Nations is part of the Treaty of Versailles. Let's talk about a treaty and how a treaty is established in our country. So according to the Constitution of the United States of America, the executive branch, that would be the presidency and all the people that work for the president, they have the ability to engage in diplomacy with other countries and to establish treaties with another country. But in order for the treaty to go into effect, in order for the treaty to be ratified, the Senate must have a majority approval of that treaty. So in short, the president makes the treaty, the Senate ratifies it. So did our Senate ever ratify the Treaty of Versailles? So let's get into some early 1920s politics here. Woodrow Wilson was the president of the United States of America during World War I. He was a Democrat. The Senate in the late 19-teens was majority Republican. So already you know, as young Americans, we're going to have a conflict here. We're going to have a fight because we've got the Democrats controlling the executive branch and we've got the Republicans controlling the Senate. The Senate majority leader was the Republican from Massachusetts, Henry Cabot Lodge. And Henry Cabot Lodge spoke openly in the United States Congress about how the Treaty of Versailles was a terrible idea. For him, this was an issue of sovereignty. Now, coincidentally, I mean, he didn't know the future of the 1920s. He didn't see the League of Nations as being an organization with too little power, but rather with too much power. He believed that the League of Nations might be able to start passing legislation to essentially become a governing body that could ultimately control the United States of America. So for him, this is an issue of sovereignty. Sovereignty is our independence. Sovereignty is for the United States of America to be controlled only by the people of the United States of America, not any other foreign power. And so he encourages the Senate not to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, because the Treaty of Versailles contains within it the provision for the creation of the League of Nations. And this League of Nations might become this international governing body that can tell the United States of America and all the other countries in the world what to do. So we see the concerns of Henry Cabot Lodge reflected here in this cartoon. Here you have Uncle Sam standing on the United States of America and his hands are bound behind his back by these tethers, these ribbons, and on the ribbons say the United, the League of Nations. And you see other countries pulling on these tethers, keeping Uncle Sam handcuffed. And it's interesting, you look at the different uh, characters that are controlling Uncle, Uncle Sam. You've got uh, on the far right there, the Empire of Japan. Up front, you've got the European nations, and then you've got other foreign nations, and then you have England, all of them are controlling the USA. Now again, in the 1930s, the League of Nations is going to prove to be a fairly weak organization, but that's not how Henry Cabot Lodge saw it in 1920, or in 1919 and 1920. He's really concerned about the League of Nations having some sort of control over the, over the United States. 
So he is the Republican leader of the Senate. He says, don't vote in favor of it. And the Senate refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, which is ironic because Woodrow Wilson, who conceptualized the idea of the League of Nations and every country in the world joined the League of Nations, except for the United States of America. We were never part of the League of Nations. Wilson was livid. His own country betrayed him. So how does Woodrow Wilson respond? Well, he wants to get the Republicans out of the Senate. So Woodrow Wilson goes on a whistle-stop barnstorming campaign throughout the United States of America to encourage Americans to vote for new Democratic senators in the 1920 elections to get the Republicans out, to flip the Senate so that we can have a majority of Democrats in the Senate who will ratify the Treaty of Versailles and get the United States of America in the League of Nations. So Woodrow Wilson gets on a train, gets on many trains actually, travels all around the United States of America giving speech after speech after speech. 53,000 Americans died in World War I. Did they die for nothing? We need to create peace on earth forevermore. We need to get into the League of Nations. Vote Democrat, vote Democrat, vote Democrat. While Woodrow Wilson was doing this, when he was in Colorado, he suffered from a stroke. He was incapacitated. He was incapable of functioning as the president of the United States of America. He was, as quietly as possible, shipped directly back to Washington, D.C., where he goes to bed in the White House and doctors begin attending to him. Now, this was qu kept as quiet as possible. The one person who did have access to him was his wife, Edith. And what happens during Woodrow Wilson's last year as president of the United States of America is the stuff of speculation and legend. Woodrow Wilson saw very, very, very few people, but there were people who wanted to converse with the president. Edith took charge in protecting her husband. He had had a stroke, he was sick, he was frail, he needed to stay in bed. So what Edith started doing was taking over the role of the president. If you wanted to communicate with Woodrow Wilson, you did not communicate with Woodrow Wilson. You spoke to Edith. And she said, I will speak to the president for you. So politicians, ambassadors, cabinet officials, the people who needed to talk to President Wilson never talked to President Wilson. They spoke to Edith. And Edith, supposedly, took the topics and issues and concerns and whatever people want to talk to Wilson about. She went directly to Woodrow Wilson, spoke to her husband, got his feedback in one brief meeting, and then Edith reported back to those diplomats, politicians, cabinet officials, etc. There are some people who believe that Edith was doing what she said she was doing, which was being an intermediary between the president and those that needed to talk to the president. And there are other people who believe that Edith Wilson was our first female president because she was running the country. But the Whistle Stop campaign, it ended in failure. And to repeat myself, the United States of America never joined the League of Nations. The Doughboys. Military service was very different in World War I than it is today. Today, if you join the military and you serve honorably, in other words, you're not discharged dishonorably, but you do your service, well, then you are entitled to certain benefits like a pension, health care, education. Well, that didn't exist in World War I. Once the United States of America was done saving the world at, world, at the end of World War I, we became an isolationist country once again. Our unwillingness to join the League of Nations was symbolic of that. And the number of men who served in the military was once again significantly reduced. So these men came home and they were now no longer part of the United States military. No longer soldiers in the Army or the Navy. They were once again just civilians. So they tried to go back to their old jobs. But with the war over, manufacturing went into severe decline. There were too many men, not enough jobs, and America began experiencing an economic recession not long after World War I ended. So many of the men who went to fight for the United States of America to win the First World War returned home to hardship. You may remember from earlier that there was a new type of casualty in the First World War. 
Traditionally, a casualty was anybody who was dead, wounded, or missing in battle. But in World War I, there's the new type of casualty, the individuals who suffered from shell shock. Now, shell shock, which today we call post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, has always existed in warfare. So don't think it started in the 20th century. It did not. There's plenty of historical evidence for it going all the way back to antiquity. However, the industrialization of warfare in the First World War created extreme forms of post-traumatic stress disorder in which soldiers completely broke from reality. So I would like to show you a brief film clip of what this looked like. Men whose bodies have no physical injury, but you can tell their minds have separated from reality because of the trauma of industrialized warfare. There's also a little bit in this film clip of how doctors tried to help them. So this is shell shock. Shell shock represented a kind of mutiny, a personal withdrawal from an intolerable reality. Not all or even most soldiers suffered from shell shock. But those who did were sobering examples of what mechanized warfare could do to human beings. Rifleman Arthur Russell was, or had been, a magnificent specimen of manhood, six feet tall. There was not a mark on him, yet he was helpless as a child. When I returned about a month later, I found Russell trying to walk. His speech was slowly returning, a slow, halting speech full of stammers. But I doubt if he ever again became a fully fit man. The symptoms were often tied to an event on the battlefield. The soldier who bayoneted an enemy in the face developed a facial tick. This man responded to nothing, except the word bomb, which sent him scurrying under the bed. This French soldier became hysterical at the sight of an officer's red hat. for most enlisted men involved rest and recuperation. There is some extraordinary material about the way in which soldiers who were incapable of acting were taught first to sew, then to weave, then to farm, and then to carry a gun and then to shoot it again. Uh, as if they're moving from a kind of feminine recuperation to masculine combat status and that they can go back to the, to the men's war. The worst cases left doctors grasping for solutions. Electric shock treatment was applied to thousands. Some improved. For the rest, the pain of treatment only added to their misery. But this was not the only experimental method of treating shell shock. Other types of injuries were very physical. There were a great deal of facial injuries during the First World War. This is because of trench warfare. You can imagine how having a horrible facial disfigurement would completely change how people would look at you. This was a day and age before plastic surgery, any type of facial reconstruction. And it was devastating for men who fought for their country to return back home and for people not to be able to look at him because of some grotesque facial disfigurement. So this inspired an artist from Massachusetts, a woman by the name of Anna Coleman Ladd, to leave Massachusetts to go to France to create essentially masks, masks that looked like a real human face so that men could return home with at least a little bit more dignity. If you're interested in learning more about Anna Coleman Ladd, and the pretty incredible facial prosthetics that she created for these men 
with these horrible facial injuries, check out the liner notes for this video. I've included a link to a very short film on Anna Coleman Ladd, where you can see her, her prosthetic masks, and the severe injuries of the men that she worked with. And at the end of the First World War, the very end of the First World War, a new enemy arose. Influenza. The flu. A deadly flu virus that got the name the Spanish flu, even though it likely emerged out of Kansas in the middle of the United States of America in the middle of the 19-teens. The Spanish flu killed more people in the last six months of the war than the entire war itself killed. There are only very rough estimates of how many people died around the world. On this slide, I have 20 million, but there are other estimates which go as high as 50 million. Here in the United States of America, 25% of Americans got sick. Over the course of two years, 675,000 Americans died. Percentage-wise, that would be the equivalent of about 2 million Americans dying today. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about the influenza pandemic of 1918, and in particular, how it compares to the coronavirus pandemic of 2020, I also have a brief film clip included in the liner notes to this film. The cultural impact of the First World War on the United States of America was one of loss of innocence. There was a sense that the 20th century had arrived. Industrial warfare had arrived. There was, around Europe and the United States of America, a new cynicism, a distrust with traditional American life. This inspired a new generation of writers and of artists. They were referred to as the lost generation. Many of them felt a lot of discontent with the United States of America, and they chose to leave the United States to go to Paris, France. And finally, there was one last fight that was going on at the same time as the First World War. The famous 19th century suffragettes Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton had passed away. They were gone. But in the early 20th century, there was a new generation of suffragettes, women who wanted to fight for the right to vote. One of them, seen here, Alice Paul, decided to use the United States of America's entry into the First World War to make the world safe for democracy as a springboard to force Woodrow Wilson and the government of the United States of America to give, finally, half the population of the United States the right to vote. Alice Paul and the First World War gave women in the United States of America, finally, the right to vote and the 19th Amendment, which passed in August of 1920, just in time for the November 1920 presidential election. We'll learn more about that in the next lecture. And this concludes this lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about your country's role in the First World War. I certainly enjoyed teaching it. Hey, that ends this lecture. Thanks for paying attention. Hope you learned a lot of good stuff. Have a wonderful day, United States history students. See you next time.